Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole and on today's show, we're going to be talking about EMF exposure or Wi-Fi exposure is another way to think about that and all the ways it can potentially impact our health and our kids' behavior. EMF stands for electromagnetic fields and we're exposed to these fields in bigger ways and, and more than ever before with our increasing use of electronic devices, our smartphones, just the presence of Wi-Fi in the environment. And while those things provide great benefit to us, we've also started to become aware that this increased exposure can cause health problems for people. And it can especially be a concern for kids and adults with sensitive neurological systems. And it's something that I've been seeing clinically um, more and more in kids that people are just becoming more sensitive to this stuff. So here today to help us better understand these issues and what we can do about it is Peter Sullivan. And let me tell you a little bit about Peter. Peter's the founder and CEO of Clearlight Ventures, as well as an environmental health funder who focuses on toxins and wireless safety. He spent the last 15 years successfully recovering his two sons from autism and sensory issues and recovered from his own environmental health issues. Peter's work on detoxification and EMF have been featured in the book Toxin Talks Out, the book The Out of Sync Child Grows Up, Mother Jones Magazine, and many more. He's an executive producer of the documentary Generation Zapped about the health effects of wireless and co-executive producer of the film The Devil We Know about Teflon pollution. Peter also serves as a board advisor to Pure Earth and the International Institute for Building Biology Ecology. Previously, he worked as a software designer, making software easier to use at places like Netflix and Interwoven and Silicon Graphics. He also served as an executive officer and pilot in the United States Army. Peter has a BA in psychology from the University of Detroit and an MS in computer science from Stanford University. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the show today, Peter. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. You have such a fascinating background um, because actually what you went to school for and started out working um, you know, in as a career is quite different from what you're doing now with the advocacy work and the education work you're doing. So I'd love for you to talk to us about um, this journey that you've taken and how you got involved in doing education and work around EMS. Um, yeah, I have kind of a wild background. I come from a medical family and I started studying psychology in, in college, but then um, decided I wanted to do something, I don't know, I wanted to do a little bit more engineering. There was something between engineering and psychology that I wanted. And it turned out that that was more software design, design basically, which, or human factors, which hadn't really, I didn't have exposure to, the field hadn't grown up yet. So um, I ended up coming out of school, becoming a Navy pilot for a while, and, um, and then went to Silicon Valley. And then I started out as a troubleshooter and worked my way up as, to a software engineer and eventually found that I really liked software design. And you know, so it's basically like being an architect for a house as you're designing the experience out, framing things out and saying, this is what I want to happen and working with the engineers to, uh, to you know, make that experience happen. Um, and, um, and then, so things just kind of moved along in my career. And, um, and the challenge was, I think our big inciting incident is when my, you know, I'm working in the middle of the, the internet bubble, running the front page of Excite and doing all these things, going back to grad school at Stanford. And my son got kicked out of preschool, mm. just straight up. And I came home from work and I, I, I couldn't even comprehend what was going on. So, uh, and, they, and they wanted him to get a diagnosis and everything. You know, I come from my dad's psychiatrist, I come from a medical family. I, I thought we were gonna be helping other people not on the other end of this. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, we stopped and we kind of paid attention to things and clearly my son was, was really sensitive. And, uh, and I realized I was pretty sensitive too. So we spent a couple of years looking at sensor integration and trying to make our homes as sensory friendly as possible. Mm -hmm. And in that experience, I realized, you know, he could get, overloaded by noise and textures and you know all kinds of things and one of them was television like if he was watching too much tv he would really get overloaded and i always thought it was the content being too stimula stimu uh, stimulating but eventually i realized it was these big magnetic fields and electric fields from the television itself you didn't even have to be watching and i was sitting in front of one of those really big 20 inch monitors and throughout the 90s you know it's basically an electron gun pointed right at your frontal lobe and um, 
so I, you know, I just, between my son and I, I was just experimenting, like what, you know, what do we need to do to calm this environment down? And uh, eventually I got to, I realized my son, you know, needed outside time too, not too much computer time, too much TV time, needed to go outside to balance. And that became pretty obvious. And I think a lot of people are realizing that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then I started being, being able to feel the effects of the, the big screens. Mm. I bought a, a screen shield. My dad used to make me limit my TV use as a kid and would say, you know, get back from the TV screen, because in, the t- in those days, there were really x-rays I mean, coming off the TV screens, and even the early CRTs. So I got a little shield, an electric field shield for the front of my screen, and I put it on, and I didn't notice any difference. It was kind of a glare screen, too. But then when I moved offices, and I, fr- I hadn't put it back on, I sat down, and I was like, oh, I feel the monitor now. Mm-hmm. And I put the screen back up. And that was maybe 2002 or three, I felt that. Mm. And as my, as, as my basic, as my immune system got worse and worse, I became more and more sensitive to all these things. Uh, I you know, got to the point where I, I couldn't put a phone next to my head. If I put a phone next to my head, it, it felt weird. Mm-hmm. It felt kind of squishy. And, um, and even pl- going under a desk to plug in a transformer, I remember doing that one day and my head just felt kind of off for about 40 mm-hmm. minutes. So that was in the mid 2000s, and I was struggling to find people who knew anything about this at all. I, you know, it was really hard to talk about people. People thought you had a mental health issue if you brought this up, and a lot of people still do. I have a I live next to a psychiatrist here, and a psychiatrist at Stanford, and I was telling him about my film Generation Zapped, and he says, "Oh, I have a patient who is complaining about electrical stuff. I just assumed she had a mental health issue." I'm like, "No, she's having a physical experience that is impacting her mental health. It's not." You know, so, so that's kind of a bummer. So I, I ended up, you know, doing all this work in Silicon Valley and I eventually realized I needed to focus on my kids' health and on my health. And so about 2000, early 2005, I quit my job at Netflix and I um, started taking this journey about how are, we gonna, how are we gonna resolve this? You know, I started doing a lot of the biological work that some people are doing. Mm-hmm. So we had done sensory work and we did some of the environmental things to create a nice sensory environment. but you know, I wanted to do a deep dive and we looked at toxins and we went through that for quite a while. And, and that helps, that all helped and that was good. But as the EMF levels kept ramping up, you know, you just have, you were moving things, but then things are piling up at the same time. So I think really one of the big tipping points is when smartphones came out in 2008, um, especially like the Apple phone and mm-hmm. so forth, people were carrying these phones that they weren't just um, sending out radiation when they were calling, now they're constantly going back and forth. And I had had that, now being in Silicon Valley, I got exposures that other people didn't have. Also in the military, I got a lot of radar exposures um, and aircraft and so forth. And, uh, and I was working, when I was working at Interwoven, I w- worked next to an Air Force base that had a space radar. We didn't know about it at the time, but our building was getting hit by the space radar signal every six seconds. So I thought that my fatigue and everything was caused by maybe, I didn't know if it was yeast overgrowth or mercury poisoning some of the things that I had, but it was probably a combination of multiple things, but including this wireless exposure. So I don't want to say it's just wireless, but it's usually something that people don't think about at all. And it's usually a missing piece. And I went on for, oh, maybe a decade or so before I kind of figured it out. I don't want people to wait that long because it really, it really screwed me up. I mean, I was, uh, right now I'm about 160 pounds, about 5'10". In 2009, I had done, I was doing everything I could. I was eating organic. I was exercising. Um, and I got down to 131 pounds. Mm, wow. My teeth were cracking. I was not sleeping well. So, and that's the big one. So the sleep disruption is the most mm-hmm. common symptom. I didn't know that. Uh, and it, and so I want everybody to, to know what these, these common health effects are and, and what we can do about it. So yeah, it took me a while to figure out the wireless fat, the wire, the first I started with, there's different components of electromagnetic fields. It's like talking about toxins. Mm-hmm. So there are, um, and, and sometimes this is maybe almost too technical. So basically, maybe we'll just start talking about these modern electronics and I'll get into this a little bit later if we, if we want. But um, so- Yeah, are- I, I'd love to get into, yeah, I, I definitely wanna get into some of the, the detail of it for sure. And what I think is so remarkable about your story is you, you were sort of the canary in the coal mine with some of this being in Silicon Valley and being exposed to some things um, well before, you know, other people were. I mean, when you and I were 
we're talking previously, you said, yeah, I had a smartphone before most of the population had a smartphone, right? And so you began to feel some of the effects of that. And, and I just want to highlight something that you said that, that I think is so important about this, that so many people still think that this isn't a real phenomenon. Like you're talking about psychiatrist next door. It was like, oh, well, I just thought my patient maybe was, you know, a little bit psychotic or had some paranoia or whatever because she was complaining about these things. And th this is a real, this is a real thing. And, you know, even for myself, I noticed over the last several years that I was getting really sensitive to having my laptop on my lap. You know, we use electronic um, medical records here at the clinic. I've got my laptop with me all the time. And I began to realize more and more, like, I'm not feeling well having my computer right here on me. And, and it finally hit me, you know, I, I did a little experiment um, with it of having the laptop on my lap versus having it on a table and realized that that's what was making me feel unwell. And it is kind of hard to describe, like my head just didn't quite feel right. I felt a little bit nauseous. Um, and that definitely has gotten worse um, for me over time to now I just don't put any of those things right on me. I have little tables at the clinic, you know, patients will, you know, um, notice that I, I have my laptop sitting on a small table near my chair in, in our patient treatment rooms because I cannot have that on me. The, the area that I work at, at home in my home office, we moved the wireless router to the other side of the house because having it right next to me there was affecting me. So I just... I really, I, I want to just highlight that early on in this conversation that this is not something that, oh, maybe only happens to one in a million people. It's not something that, you know, we should disregard. These are real experiences that we have with this stuff. No, I think that's one of my biggest things is that the science is out there right now, but we haven't had these conversations. So that's the reason we do the tent, the tent that you saw at the Autism One conference. Yeah. We have, a wire, we have a tent that is shielded from wireless exposure. So when you go inside, you go from like 5,000 microwatts or whatever the measurement is to almost zero. And we find that about 95% of people have a felt experience. Yeah. And you can, what was, can you describe your felt experience in there? Absolutely. In fact, I was talking to a colleague earlier today about this as I was prepping for our interview. And, and I said to her, you know, you walk around in the convention hall area in the hotel, whatever, and, and you walk into that tent that you guys set up and there is a palpable difference. Like I just felt my entire brain and body just like calm. Um, and it is sort of hard to describe, but you realize like there's just this internal chaos and commotion of being out in you know, the, the, the regular environment. And I went into that space and, and probably the best way I can say is like a calming or just sort of a grounding. And I realized as, as we sat there and you and I were talking and I was talking to some other people on your team, the longer I sat there, I, I became more aware that I constantly have sort of, I wouldn't say a buzzing, but there's sort of like this hum in the brain and in the ears all the time. And the longer I sat in that shielded tent, the more I realized, wow, that's just not there anymore. So it, there, it really is a felt difference with that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and that's actually the, that's the common experience we get from most people is they say, the most common word we hear is, I feel calm here. Yeah. I feel, some people say, I feel peaceful, or mm -hmm. I feel, I, some people, they feel their body more. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They feel peace around their heart or head or body. Mm -hmm. um, and and or some, I've heard people say, I feel like I'm out in nature. Yeah. That's another one, but... You know, and so we've had these experiences, but frequently we'll have our phone on, you know, frequently we don't turn our phones off when we're out in nature now. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you do get away from it for a while, you do feel better, but we don't have a quick on off discerning sensory experience. And those experiences are really powerful. And so I wanted to say, allow, you know, you know, let, we'll give people, we'll talk about ways that people can have that experience mm -hmm. at home. I mean, certainly you can go turn your phone off or also if you have a fitness tracker or a smartwatch, mm -hmm. leave those in the car, turn them to airplane mode turn off Bluetooth and then, you know, go for a hike or something for an hour and then come back. And then usually, and even my, my medical doctor came back and he's, we were talking about this a couple of years ago. He says, I go out hiking in the woods and I come home and the house feels like it's buzzing. Yeah. And, and you're like, yeah, your body's now, you know, you can almost become just like you become nose blind to certain smells. We become used to the buzzing sound in our he hearing, which is basically called frequently people will say it's tinnitus, but it's really microwave hearing. You're hearing microwave frequencies, so the audio auditory nerve is being interfered with by microwaves, and you're hearing that noise. And that's you know that's a that's the second most common symptom of of wireless exposure. The most common is sleep disruption. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like you know we know that if you leave a blue light a light on at night, or especially blue light, it'll inter interrupt your melatonin. 
you should think of wireless as light at a frequency lower than we can see that it's still hitting your, the photons are still hitting your body. Mm -hmm. And it also interrupts melatonin, just like, um, you know, like leaving a light on at night. Mm -hmm. So what we tell people to do when they want to, I'll say you want to have this experience. So you can go out during the day and have that, that experience in nature. Now, how do you have that at home? Mm -hmm. And so what we've been telling people to do, people tend to be a little resistant to this at first. So we'll, so this is Dr. Tori Yelter in California invented this protocol, which is pretty brilliant, where you just at night, at, you know, around bedtime or even at twilight or earlier, the better, you turn off your, if you have a baby monitor, you turn off the baby monitor. Mm -hmm. You turn off, if you have a cord, if you still have a cordless phone in the house, you turn off the A station. That's, mm -hmm. that's the emitter that's constantly emitting. Again, the baby monitor is constantly emitting the cordless phone base station, the Wi-Fi unit. Uh, and then, you know, if you really, if you want to go to the next level, you can even turn the circuit breaker off mm -hmm. for the background to make sure that the magnetic fields and all these other things aren't affecting um, yourself or the child. And that's a nice way. And so we'll, most commonly we'll see people sleep better when they do that. Mm -hmm. And that's just a free way to lean into this. And we try to get people just free and easy ways mm -hmm. to lean into these things. Um, yeah. And this year, I, this year at the conference at Autism One, I was started to just do a very simple list mm -hmm. of things, working, working from the body out. Mm -hmm. So more and more we're seeing not only people with smartphones, but with smart watches and mm -hmm. trackers, and even the iPods, so all these wearables. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those are constant emitters. And some people say, well, what about Bluetooth? Is it lower? Yes, it's lower, but it's mm -hmm. still bad. And it's, if you put it right in your ear, it's not gonna be good. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get people away from the, you know, the wearables and just start move the, move those away. And it's tricky because we we spent the time and money and we love these things and they're mm -hmm. beautiful, and they're right. fun. Right. So there's an addictive element. There's this sunk cost element to it. But you know, at some point you realize this stuff is really not empowering. My my goal going back at Stanford to get my master's was I wanted to empower people with personal technology. Mm. And then I realized, and so I knew all the cell phone designers, like Tony Fidel and uh, Drew Bamford, who was in Stanford and class with me, was like the pixel designer now. So these guys, you know, Tony Fidel, who invented the iPhone, these guys are buddies of mine and pioneers in this field. And we thought that this was all going to be good. We didn't realize how, how this was going to go. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we didn't have this information. But the U.S. government kind of knew about this in the Navy from, uh, the Navy had a lot of data, even in the early 70s, about exposures from radar operators. And so our current signals from our phones are very much like these pulsed radar signals mm -hmm. that we've had for decades that most people weren't exposed to that were operational exposures, but now we're exposing children to this mm -hmm. constantly. And so, so again, working from the body out, you can either turn it off, you can move it away. When you double the distance, the, um, the radiation drops off 75%. Mm. So it drops off exponentially, so the far so distance is your friend. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can't move, if you can't turn it off and you can't move it away, you can also move away from it. Mm -hmm. right? So if you have a smart meter on your home and you know you can't opt out of it or something, you can move the bed to the other side of the room or move, go to another bedroom, you know, get as far away from that as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also shielding and other complex things, but there's a lot of simple and free things you can do uh, right now. Well, and I think you're exactly right that it's a hard sell for a lot of people because this stuff has become such a part of our daily life and because we don't see it, right? And so it's kind of hard to, you know, think about something impacting us when we look around and we say, well, I don't see that around me. I don't see that harming me. And, and that's what I love about the little experiment that you said to do like at night is just to see what happens when you turn the things off. And, you know, going into the, the tent that you have at conferences, it helps people really get a clear sense of that because there are so few, if any, places that we can go anymore, at least in the U.S., where we're not exposed to it. So it's just become our norm and we've lost a sense of what it feels like to not have our brains and bodies around this. And, and that's what I think is really powerful for people to feel that difference. And, and what I see in clinical practice, and, and I'm sure you, you have seen this in your work as well, children, um, it, particularly kids with sensitive neurological systems tend to be 
really um, more impacted um, by this. And, and if, if you are a parent or a teacher or a professional or whatever who doesn't really notice that's an issue for yourself, you may not be as attuned to it. I, because of my own personal experience with it now, am pretty attuned to it, you know, with right. kids. But, but I think that that's something that we overlook a lot. And so people don't even, this isn't even on their radar as something to be thinking about that could be impacting their child's health or functioning or things like that? No, it's really insidious. It's a real challenge. Um, I, it's a challenge. How do you make these something invisible, visible? Mm -hmm. And again, we've tried to do it with a felt experience. Right. Um, we've done it also with, like you'll see at the conference, we'll have a meter. And yeah. the meter translates the wireless signals into auditory. And you'll hear a ta 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 ta, -ta. It sounds harsh, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people, imagine having, you know, this sound or... If you had this sound on all the time, it would drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. Or if you had a light flickering at this level, it would really annoy you. I mean, we know how sensitive people are getting to sounds and all these mm -hmm. things. You know, this is the irony of it is this is our, this exposure creates, you know, gets the body more inflamed and creates, makes us more sensitive. So when you have a concussion or a hangover or some sort of neural inflammation, um, you become more sensitive to this stuff. And you'll see this trending already now. There's softer clothes. Mm -hmm. Everyone's becoming more sensitive. Everyone's becoming more sensitive to everything, like overly sensitive to yep. emotion stuff and so forth. So we really need to lighten that load. And people need to understand that this is an invisible part of our sensory environment. Mm -hmm. But it can be felt and it can be heard and, and measured. It's yep. not it's not woo woo at all. This is you know right. So. Absolutely. I want to I want to just be clear for people. You've mentioned a few of the different types of ways that we're exposed to this. You talked about like um, baby monitors, Wi-Fi routers, wearable smartphones. I mean, uh, so so pretty much anything that um, has any kind of signal or plugs, and I mean any of this stuff emits these waves, right? Yeah. I mean, basically, so we have a lot of devices that emit wireless. So if it's using you know, if it's using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth mm -hmm. or, you know, 4, 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever, that, those are wireless protocols. Yeah. And I don't know of any protocols that are, I mean, maybe the old analog AM, AM FM radio signals were pretty uh, biologically compatible, but the more modern square pulsed waves mm -hmm. are harsh on our bodies. And, you know, if you, just like sound, I think sound's a great analogy to drive this home. There's music that, that that makes our bodies feel good and then there's noise like nails on a chalkboard that's harsh and so our body is is sensing what's going on in the environment and these signals send the body into cell danger mode like that there's something harmful going on mm -hmm. we're not meant to be and that and it's fine to go into cell danger mode here and there but we're not meant to be in that state all mm -hmm. the time right so this stuff is all around us, and you've mentioned a couple of the, the big things that people may experience, or, or sort of like symptoms that people may have related to exposure. You said sleep is a big one, right? Which is becoming more and more of a chronic problem for kids and adults. Um, you said sort of like it's some of the sensory sensitivities, um, uh, the tinnitus, like the ringing in the ears. What are some other common things, just for people to be aware of in terms of what, what are some of the common symptoms that people can experience? Um, well, the most common symptoms we have on this, we had a wireless, we did a wireless safety card uh, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And on the back, we had the most common symptoms. So I'll mm -hmm. try to read them out. Great, this super. BlueLightVentures.com, it's on the front page. So actually the one of the more, so we talked about sleep being the most common mm -hmm. insomnia. Ear ringing is number two, but we have anxiety, mm -hmm. headaches, uh, attention problems, memory problems, even can be depression. And the most concerning also is even sperm damage. So you can have DNA damage from this exposure. It's quite, it's quite serious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had some people, yeah, have some serious mental health issues because of the exposure. And, you know, it's not always just the wireless. There's a combination things frequently. But, um, and these are, these are written up. So this, the, the references are on the back. Some of these are like one of the references from the Navy. The Navy knew, had 2000 studies back in 2000 or 1972 hmm. and with over 100 different health effects. I don't even know all the health effects. It, it's almost like playing pinball. It depends on how your body's inflamed in your genetics, mm -hmm. where your weaknesses are and your body, and this will stress you and, and you'll play to that weakness. You know, mm -hmm. if you've got inflammation, joint inflammation, Mm -hmm. uh, skin, actually, a lot of people have skin issues, mm -hmm. be like mast cell activation, 
-hmm. In some environments, my skin would feel kind of hot and prickly. Mm -hmm. I would also get red, red ears for me was an exposure. Mm -hmm. I was kind of, you know, headache, red ears, and it was just kind of an inflammatory overload through the body. Mm -hmm. So if you think of this as, you know, if, if you think of our, if we're having a neuroinflammatory epidemic right now of inflammation from multiple factors, chemical and mm -hmm. all kinds of exposures, this is one of those factors that's kind of pushing on that. I, I totally agree. And I, I think like if we, if we think about the spectrum of, you know, neurodevelopmental and mental health issues that people can have, you know, sometimes you have a kid with just lower level issues, some, some irritability, some anxiety, maybe some sleep issues, whatever. And you take some actions like we're going to talk about here to just reduce um, exposure and things really clear up well for them. And then all the way to people, you know, kids maybe on the other end of that spectrum with very, very severe multiple kinds of, um, you know, uh, neurological and physiological things the the strategies that we might use to mitigate some of the, the EMF exposure, it might not resolve all those issues, but certainly it will help support, you know, the, the brain and the body's functioning and, and allow other things to work better. And that's how I look at it. It's like anything that we can do, especially with these types of things, to just support the body and the brain to function better is going to help all the other therapies or whatever else we need to do. It's going to help them work better. Exactly. It's lightening the, the total load that, you know, mm -hmm. Patty Lamer and Martha Herbert talk about total yeah. load. Um, it, it lightens that load. And if you can just get to the point where your body can keep up with the load, if you're not, over, when you're not overloaded, that's kind of the key issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, and our bodies are really resilient. By the time we see symptoms, you've really got a, usually a big pile up of things going on. It's usually not one thing, but the EMFs and I think glyphosate, a couple other exposures to the mm -hmm. aluminum, other things have been piling up. Yeah. And, go, and we need to really take um, strong measures to unload ourselves. Absolutely. So let's talk about, you know, I think we've um, helped people become aware of what the, the risks and the issues are with these exposures. Let's delve into some of the practical things that parents and families can do to help reduce exposure, uh, you know, and, and support themselves with this issue. Well, I think I, I kind of said, yeah, I gotta, I've got a gardener here blowing right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's always how it goes. <laughs> that's always how it goes. Well, let me see. I'll, what I'll do is I'll step through this little checklist that we did. And I kind of said, start with the body. We'll start with the sleep environment first. When we sleep well, all is good. That's, you know, what we're truly trying to. So if you really just focus on the sleep environment first, and that's key. So again, some of the protocols that Dr. Yelter talked about, mm -hmm. but again, getting the wearables off. I mean, some people have even, you know, doing location trackers. Mm -hmm. Those are wireless. Um, some people are using electric blankets, mm -hmm. and those have been around for a while, but now our electricity now is not what it used to be. Our electricity is a little bit polluted. Instead of being a nice, smooth sine wave, it also has these little transient currents mm -hmm. from a lot of different wireless, uh, from a lot of different electrical devices that we have now, little transformers and things. So we need to keep some of these exposures away. So electric blanket, motorized adjustable beds. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a really big field effect. We talked about the baby monitor, you know, in autism, if there was one real big one, I would say, you know, if there's one big wire, if wireless exposure is part of autism, and I think there's some evidence that there's some strong evidence that there is, the baby monitor would be kind of a key one, especially as we're going from regular audio ones to then video, so there's more exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, greater distance, I mean, I, I, if you can get away without using a baby monitor, that would really be mm -hmm. ideal. Uh, especially because that's when your child's brain is, you know, pruning, and detoxing and all that stuff at night. So again, cell phone, a lot of people are sleeping with their cell phone next to their bed, mm -hmm. sometimes under the pillow. And that exposure is too much. They need to be, it needs to be in airplane mode with wire, with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off. If not, I mean, ideally out of the bedroom. Right. A lot of people love using it as an alarm clock. Great. Put it on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. or in the room. I have it in my office, a couple things away. I hear it. I yep. have to all the way up, it's really hard to hit the snooze button. <laughs> so I would recommend keeping, yeah, the, the cell phones and the tablets out of the bedroom, not just for the wi not just for the wireless exposure, but for also for the blue light at night, and that screen time and addiction thing. Some people are, they, they have insomnia, and then they'll pick the phone up at night and give themselves <laughs> blue light exposure, and so it's just... Yeah, um, it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. And so um, the digital assistants, so Alexa, Google Home, mm -hmm. these Sometimes they, people have them all over the place. My kids just had them in their dorms. I was telling them to turn it off at night. It's been hard. It's, it, and it's a struggle, especially with kids. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
What else? The Wi-Fi router. So again, turning that off at night, you could potentially replace some of these things with, with hard ethernet. Mm -hmm. or there's, there's even a special form of Wi-Fi called uh, eco Wi-Fi mm -hmm. that allows the, the beaconing frequency that the signal that says I'm here, I'm here, I'm here doesn't need to be 10 times a second. It can be this, this unit allows you to dial it down to once a second. Mm -hmm. So you get 90% less exposure and it doesn't slow anything down. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a nice option if you're still going to use Wi-Fi. Some people are so sensitive they really cannot mm -hmm. even do Wi-Fi at all. Yeah. So um, an LED clock or clock radio next to the bed can be a big source of magnetic fields. Mm. Some people who have migraines, when they move the clock across the room, migraines go away. Mm -hmm. So um, even this is a silly one that you wouldn't expect, um, a reading light. My mom was really big on us having reading lights next to our beds. Mm -hmm. so we could read it, so and so. But that brings that wire right next to the bed. And, and that wire, even when the, the light's not on, is like leaking is creates an electric field that's like a leak of electrons yeah. off and your body is ground and the electrons just go to your body and it's like you know like lightning going to ground hmm. so keeping those kind of away from the, the bed if you have a big electric field uh, a, a lot of people have power strips and electric cords around their beds if you could just again create some space move those away to reduce ele electrical and magnetic fields and then all these little plug-in transformers they can create big magnetic fields and also chop up these, they're called switching power supplies. They can chop up the electricity and create little surges. And those mm -hmm. surges can be very bio, they seem very small at electrical level, but they're bi very biologically active to our bodies. And that was one of my, when I lost all that weight, that's from a lot of what's called dirty electricity. A lot of those little transients in my wiring kind of right next to my head in the mm -hmm. bed. And when I fixed that problem and started addressing that with different filters and things and measurements, I gained 10 pounds back. I started sleeping 10 pounds back and, you know, went on back mostly. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, televisions. A lot of people have televisions in their bedroom yeah. and smart, especially smart TVs with streaming. So if you're streaming Netflix or one of these services, you're not only getting the, you know, the, the exposure from the TV, but you're getting the wireless exposure. So uh, a desktop, laptop, computer, sometimes people are sleeping next to those, or just your exposure all day long, as, as you mentioned. Yep. Giving yourself some distance and, and not just looking at that screen all day, getting, you know, balancing it with nature. So there's a screen time issue in here as mm -hmm. well. Uh, your refrigerator can be a really large source of magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you hear, if your refrigerator sounds kind of harsh, you know, as a, kind of an annoying, you know, um, sound to it, it means you might have dirty electricity, mm -hmm. or if you your lights buzzing and they don't sound good. Mm -hmm. It's not just that you're sensitive to it, you, you may be hearing dirt, you may be hearing those little small transient dirty electrical noises basically in the, in the wireless mm -hmm. uh, or in the, in the, um, in your wiring. So what else? And, and just all kinds of appliances. So your humidifier, air conditioner, heater, even an aquarium pump. We had this little mm -hmm. aquarium pump that had this giant magnetic field. So it's hard to guess. Sometimes, Mm -hmm. Sometimes some of these things are not that bad and sometimes they're horrible and you wouldn't expect it. Mm -hmm. um, and your electric meter or sub panel can be a large magnetic and electric field exposure. Um, and again, a smart meter can also be a wireless exposure as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can opt out of those. If you have electric, electric radiant floor heating, mm -hmm. that's a big issue, a big magnetic field. Um, wireless alarm systems. So a lot of us have well, security systems and you turn it on and off and they have wireless sensors all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that's another constant exposure. Dimmer switches can also give off, you know, when you move the dimmer switch up and down, you maybe hear a little buzz. In yeah, the, you hear it, yeah. Right, so that's dirty electricity. So dimmer switches create dirty electrical noise. They chop up the power to, and, and you know, sometimes you'll turn it up and down and you'll get it to a point where it doesn't bother you, but sometimes you put it at a point where it really will bother you, you're, you know, that's not just your hearing, but you're, you're tuning the electrical system, to, you know, in, in the interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. And that's been around for a while, but now we're getting more and more sense of these little mm -hmm. things, even a three way light switch where you can turn on a, a, a light from multiple places creates this weird loop in the house. Mm. Where you have a big magnetic field mm. so it's getting a little more advanced and fluorescent lights, complex fluorescence and led lights can create a lot of um, dirty electricity and mm -hmm. a lot of light flicker and blue light. And so you have to really be careful of those as yeah. well. So those are the common things. If you kind of go down as a little bit of a checklist, thinking from your bedroom and out mm -hmm. and trying to create more distance around your children 
and uh, around your work environments where you're, where you're working or where your kids are having exposure. And, and, there, and, and so that's a quick, those are quick things that you can kind of do. Turn it off away, you move away from it. But if, you're, if things still aren't working, and you're still struggling, there are people that can come and help you. So there are, I'm on the advisory, I'm an advisor to the building biologists, and you can look for a search for a building biologist in your area. There's a thing called, find, they find their website, and find an expert, mm -hmm. and you can find someone who's trained in electromagnetic field measurement and mitigation, and they'll come and they'll measure magnetic fields, electric fields, wireless radiation, and dirty electricity, mm -hmm. and they can help you, you know, find out which circuits in your building are a problem, which, you know, appliances and how to, to deal with those and, and better solutions, maybe even help you shield from things that, that aren't in your control, like a neighbor's exposure and so forth. Yeah, super helpful. And I think certainly a field that's going to be more and more needed, right, for people to help with that. And, and I've had that experience with some patient families at the clinic, too, um, two particular situations that stand out to me in relation to kids having pretty significant seizure problems. And the one, we were able to connect it directly to starting in a new um, school where they had the smart boards and just a ton more technology all the time. And the seizures were going up, going up, going up. And we finally, after some playing around and, and you know, trying to figure out what was going on, pinpointed it to the increase started as he was in that new environment. And when there was a longer break and he was out of that environment, the seizures stopped. And so it, it really, you know, things like migraine, things like, um, you know, panic attacks, irritability, um, impulsivity, the seizures, all that kind of stuff that we might not attribute to those things in the environment, it can really be a big factor. Oh, yeah, no. I, one of the folks, the autistic kids I was working with here in the Bay Area, uh, had a seizure. They said, oh, I, we were talking about this issue. And she says, you know, the last time we had a seizure, they, she was streaming a video on her iPad on her lap. And I said, well, obviously, why, you know, yeah. so that is one of the symptoms. And you could consider this a form of excitotoxicity, mm. just like having eating like MSG. Mm -hmm. It gets the body overexcited. It's, a, it's like a neurotoxin that overexcites and the body just gets overwhelmed by that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also frequently people will go, like we talked about anxiety, if you go in a, you're, you're in a building, you're saying, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. Actually, sometimes it's not even you. You're feeling mm -hmm. the building. You're feeling the wireless signals or the electric or the dirty electricity or the magnetic fields or something in that building. And you're like a fish in water. And it's not about you so much. It's about mm -hmm. the building. And, yeah. when you, you know, and so to, to have that discerning experience that it's not just, it's not you. If someone, especially if someone puts a label on you and says, oh, you're anxious, so-and-so, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm responding to the environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Hey, talk, talk for a minute about, because I, I, I have um, families come in and, and ask me about this on a fairly regular basis. You know, there, there are um, products and things now out there that say that they help protect or shield these things. So, you know, uh, things like maybe iPad covers or smartphone, things that you can put your smartphone in or, you know, things like that that can help shield these. Are those effective? I mean, what, what's your thought on, on those as a strategy? Yeah. Um, so, yes, they can be effective. Um, there's some debate on those and we'll talk about that. But um, I like to have people start by just turning it off and moving it away first because it's all free until they buy in and they know it impacts them. Yeah. And then you can start playing around with different shielding and things and so forth. So um, one that people use for, there's one product called Safe Shield mm -hmm. that it can be used for a phone or an iPad. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a, like a cover that goes around the phone and shields it on, on one of the sides. Mm -hmm. Now, the tricky thing is some of the activists will say, you know, when, that it can bounce it back and double it, you know, double the exposure to you as well. And that, that, those, those are true factors. Um, if your body's really sensitive, like mine, I remember my hand would get really sensitive just holding. I would never put a phone next to my head. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not even, the, the manufacturers tell you not to do that either. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't do that. I never done that. But I found when I was using a cell phone here and there, traveling a lot, mm -hmm. getting an you know, Uber or Lyft, my hand would start feeling kind of prickly things. So mm -hmm. I ended up getting a safe sleeve. And, and going backward and you flip it behind it and then and then I it would use that to protect my hand mm -hmm. there's some other ones I've tried to um, uh, cruise case uh, I think safe sleeve is really well designed and done cruise case is really um, well tested mm -hmm. um, there was one more RF safe is another one that I've tried I like there's this new graphene version of that so I've played with those 
I haven't been super rigorous about the testing. I've kind of gone off my own feeling and sensation of them. Mm -hmm. I've measured them with meters and I'm getting some reduction, but we really need to have a special near field meter to measure that stuff. But um, yeah, they can be effective, but don't, um, don't assume that they're safe, mm. right? So, you know, it's, it's gonna reduce the exposure, but you know, is it safe enough to, uh, you know, I still wouldn't put a phone in my pocket with, a sa you know, with one of these shields in it, uh, you know, and I'd be worried about how it would affect my, um, you know, could be potentially damaged by uh, sperm, right. basically. Well, and I think that's a big deal, and, and let's touch on that because it's something that um, I have talked with. I have three teenage boys, and I have talked to them about that, and they all know now to, you know, turn, put it on airplane mode in their pocket, but that's a big thing, right? I mean, we've got these devices, um, you know, we're putting them in our front pockets, our back pockets, you know, women will often put them maybe in a purse or something, but there are women too who will carry them even in, like in the front pocket of their shirt and things like that. So that kind of exposure, what you're talking about is putting the phone to the ear. You mentioned about like the wireless, um, like AirPods and things like that. I mean, to me, these are some basic things too that we should really be looking at and going, oh, don't, don't do these things. No, I would, I, you know, what I'm telling people is I, I can't find a place on the body to put it. I mean, we were just talking to Dave Asprey. Yeah. Putting Dave from Bulletproof Coffee. He was, he said, oh, I know I'm not going to put it in my pocket. So he put it in a, he put it in a, uh, uh, he had like cargo pants and he put it down near his leg and he had a bone density scan and noticed there was lower bone density in that region. Mm -hmm. And there is a study out that you will have lower bone density in the hip where if you commonly carry yourself on, on one side of the wow. which is, you know, a big concern for the geriatric population. Yeah. So that, there's some serious, serious issues. So um, what I would recommend for kids is you know, I turn it off as much as possible. I, I just put it in airplane mode and then I turn it on when I need it. Yep. And so I keep it in a backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll put it in my pocket if it's completely off. Or, you know, if it's, if all the wireless radio antennas are off, although sometimes I, I forget and I turn it back on, even now I'm pretty, I'm pretty careful, but once in a while I'll pull it on my pocket and go, oh God, I wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. got to turn it off. Yeah. Um, so I think the safest thing is to put it in a backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know, if you're, if you're, um, if you have a, a woman and you have a purse or a backpack or some carrying, so it's a little bit off body. So I think mm -hmm. women have a little advantage there in the sense that they can kind of have, it's mm -hmm. more social, we're going to have a, a, right. a off you. Even then, I would even have maybe one of these little mylar shielding bags or something between you and the phone. Mm -hmm. So that you can go out and talk to the antenna this way, but there's a little bit of shielding between you and the And there's a company called Less CMF. They sell these little $5 mylar military grade um, bags. So you're supposed to put the phone in, but you can also just be shielded in one direction as well. So, nice. so that's one tip for the phones. But yeah, you know, we really think, it's again, we're worried about constant exposures and the closest exposures. And when we're talking about, you know, carrying these things around, I think the challenge for you as a doctor is you frequently, you need to be on call. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be on call as so much. So I just turn my phone off. So that's easy for me. But if I was in your situation, I would have a, you know, a backpack mm -hmm. or whatever, a backpack or purse with a little shielding and I would face it towards an antenna or out, out away from the building when the phone rings, I'll still hear it, but between me and the phone, there's a little bit of shielding material. Yeah, and I, I think that that's great suggestion, and the, and the reality is the vast majority of people don't need to have constant you know, access to their device like we think we do, right? And so the idea of putting it in airplane mode, you know, that's an okay thing. Nothing's probably gonna happen in the next 10 minutes that we need to, you know, immediately, uh, you know, be aware of. Um, but, but I think too, one of the things that's really concerned me, you know, the wearables for sure, I see so many more kids and young adults coming in with those, but also those um, wireless uh, earbuds. And when yeah. we look at some of the animal studies that have been done on, you know, exposure to that stuff and brain stuff, and, and you just think about, oh, it's like, I, I just, I say to, to the people at the clinic, like, let somebody else be the guinea pig for that. Don't you be the guinea pig for what that's going to look like five years or 20 years down the road from that constant exposure to that right there next to your brain. Yeah, no, there's... Um... I mean, a good, good source for the science on some of this is Safer EMR. There's um, um, a, a public health official at UC Berkeley, Joe Moshkowitz, who has a website and references some of these things. And he's written articles about, about these. Um, but I will say that I, you know, I love personal technology too. So how do you play with that? Yeah. And 
still get the benefits. So this is so there are some devices. So there are some manufacturers who are aware that this is an issue, and they're responding in a in a positive way. Really, what what we really want is we don't want to just throw these things all away and whatever. We want safe technology. It's yeah. like automobiles in the 50s before they were really safe. We would like them to be safer, and we'd like safety to become a market requirement. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, fitness tracker. This is called an Aura Ring. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Prince Harry's got one. This yeah, is getting, they're very cool. They're super cool. This allows you to go in airplane mode. Mm -hmm. So then I will put it on once a day, and then I'll download it and sync it all up, but then I put it back in airplane mode. Mm -hmm. uh, for my wife wanted one, and I got her a Garmin uh, Vivo 4, Vivo mm -hmm. Smart 4, which allows you to turn the Bluetooth off. Great. So she's reading. So the Garmin and the Aura Ring are good ones, so make sure that you can turn these things off. Mm -hmm. um, some of them aren't, like the Fitbit. I, you know really seems really interesting one of my friends is the product manager you can't turn it off you can't turn the bluetooth off and i've got some wireless speakers so be careful of the devices that you can't turn off and give feedback to the manufacturers and say please turn this off this is not only for me but as a liability protection for you mm -hmm. so that people who want to avoid this can can avoid it yeah and, and i really appreciate that point because i think yeah these are these are um, cool and, and helpful and beneficial things to have in our life and and there's new stuff coming out all the time but it is it's about making that safer and it's about all of us being more informed consumers right of what we want to be looking for in these products and and how we can be safer with them so I, I think these tips and strategies are just so practical and helpful um, before we wrap up, and any other strategies or or tips or things that you want to make people aware of that they could do. Um, let's see. So I have, I guess you can look on my website. I have some of the information we talked about at clearlightventures.com or clv.us. Yeah. Um, Dr. Moshkowitz's website is really good. Um, let's see. The, also, the film that we helped produce. Um, I wanted you to talk about that and tell people where they can find that because it's amazing. Yeah, thank you. So it's called um, Generation Zapped. Mm -hmm. And it's on, I think you can stream it on most platforms right now. It's on yeah. iTunes and Amazon mm -hmm. and more. And it's actually just a tip right now for people, at least currently, it is free to view. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it for free. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah. oh, oh, that's fantastic. Yes. I, that's, <laughs> oh, that's, that's wonderful. Okay, so, oh, I didn't know it was on that list. Wow. Uh -huh. It is, you made it. <laughs> exactly, you made it. I want to get it on Netflix too. That's my old, my old you know, stomping ground. That's right. That would really help get the awareness out there. But you know, sometimes even just sharing, you know, a lot of people are very skeptical of this and mm -hmm. just sharing the trailer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'll get, um, moms will be more, I think, in tune with the feeling stuff and the sensations. And they will feel this and say, you know, I'm, I felt this and so on. So sometimes the guys are a little bit out of touch and a little heady. And so I have did a video on YouTube called um, A Message to Dads About Wireless. And we've got yeah. a thousand views. And it's basically kind of a dad to dad conversation. It's usually the dads who are in IT and they're really got some ego around the mm -hmm. wireless stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm at ground zero. I know these guys. Like yeah. I went, I was in classes with Larry and Sergey at Stanford. <laughs> so I'm this, like, these guys are friends. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a thing and we've, we've known about it and we're being actually a little bit gullible about it. Mm -hmm. And we need, to we need to test all these things. Yeah and fix them and, and take some responsibility. Um, Love it. Love it. Such, um, such helpful information. So many things to, for parents to just be aware of and some really practical things uh, to try. So I really encourage um, all of you listening to go and check out Peter's website, check out the documentary, try some of these things, just start experimenting with it for yourself and your kids, because I really do um, believe that most people will notice um, a difference with that. So Peter, can't thank you enough for um, agreeing to spend the time with us today. Really appreciate you being here and sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode of the Better Behavior Show. We will see you back here next time.